Great. Yeah. Good to see everyone here. Welcome to the May Pi Data Triangle Meetup. I'm Arthi. Um, I'll be the host. I currently work as a data scientist for Cisco um, and passionate about data science. So cool. Let's see. So here we go. Yeah. So as you know, Vlasis usually hosts these meetings. Um, uh, but now we're on Zoom and Velasis is an advertising and marketing intelligence company that uh, uses data to enable marketing and digital success. Um, another one of our sponsors is NumFocus um, and Num NumFocus is an organization that promotes open practices in research and data and computing. So thanks to our sponsors here. Um, I'm sure everyone has seen the code of conduct, but um, as a review, uh, Pi Data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free conference experience for everyone. So um, please be kind and professional. And as we like to say, don't be mean, be above average. <laughs> Another announcement, we've gone bi-monthly. So um, we meet at the first Wednesday of odd months. So our next meetup will be July 7th. So hope to see everyone there. Um, and before we get into announcements, uh, just a quick question to you all, how can we serve the content that you want and need? So we're really interested um, in hearing from everyone and learning what sort of data science topics interest you, or if you know someone who would be interested in presenting, um, just to kind of make this conference the the most useful and most um, helpful for all of our attendees. So please contact any one of us um, either through Meetup or through email if you have any thoughts on any of these points. Cool, I guess um, from that we can go into an event announcements and jobs. So does anyone have anything to share? Interesting events, job opportunities, now's the time. Arti? Uh, I have a announcement. Go for it. Okay, so um, uh, because I've got an Excel spreadsheet addic addiction, I got involved with Alteryx Designer. I'm in the user group leadership. We are having a um, our uh, quarterly meeting next Wednesday. If anyone is interested, I'll post it in the uh, in the comment section. It's uh, we're going to be talking about process analytic process automation, and also uh, um, Neo4j charting. So if, if interested, I'll just drop the, uh, the link in there. Uh, no obligation to join the group, just attend the, uh, the online meetup. Thank you. Cool. Anyone else? Arthi, um, we have... Um... Uh, a number of engineering and um, and a, a couple of data scientist openings um, at Velasis. Um, we are um, uh, hiring a, a lot of remote as well. So I don't know, most folks are local, but I, I think you know there may be a few that are out of town. But uh, um, they uh, uh, the, the the engineering positions are. Um, Software engineering uh, across a number of different fronts. I would I would suggest going out to the uh, Velasis, uh, the com careers site and and look at the job descriptions there. Awesome. Any other events or jobs? Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, let's move on to, well, actually, I um, maybe we can talk, if anyone has an idea about a lightning talk, and this could be a talk about any sort of data science topic that interests you, um, you can speak for like five to 10 minutes or less um, in any format, um, please let me know in the chat, um, and we can cover those at the end. But uh, with that, we can get started. So is Vic on the call? I'm on. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, awesome. awesome. Cool. So um, Vic has been uh, a software engineer for 12 years with a focus on big data. Um, his current role, he works at Google solving customer AI issues in the public sector space. Um, so Vic, do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm, I intend to be presenting um, about COVID forecasting. So our team uh, in the last project worked on forecasting the spread of the disease and it's uh, pretty contemporary. So I figured it would be an interesting topic. Um, I've, this is my first time using Zoom. So I apologize for my uh, lack of Zoom experience. Um, I'm gonna try and present the screen and uh, let me start. Here you go. All right. Um, I hope you guys can see the screen right now. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, we, uh, I'm used to using Google internal products and not uh, Zoom. So this is a new experience for me. All right, let me try presenting this. All right. Um, so yeah, so this is not just um, my work. This is a team of about 30 engineers. So I'm not talking for any of those 30. I'm just talking about my experiences with this. Um, and again, anything I talk about are my own views about this project and not Google's. So uh, yeah, so putting all of that, all of those disclaimers aside, um, just want to start with like a very rough introduction on how this project started. And this was, um, like a lot of projects at Google, a uh, bottoms up engineering driven effort. And at this, this started right around the start of the pandemic. And we realized we are talking to a bunch of folks in the public sector space who are interested in understanding what's happening and what to do. And they were like looking for feedback and part of that feedback required having some kind of systematic process to be able to forecast the future. And uh, forecasting the future is a, a a notoriously hard problem. So I, I assume like we knew from the start this is not going to be great, but even if we provided them with black box models, it was not going to be very helpful. We knew that from the start because policy decisions can't be made from a black box model. So one of the goals of our um, model early on was to make it interpretable and understandable. So we were a cloudy AI team and we had we understood that what was happening had significant, significant impacts downstream. So we figured, uh, let's try to solve this. Let's build a minimum viable prototype. See if we can even build something that an epidemiologist will understand, not a computer scientist. So what we did, we essentially, as part of this, we've generated a bunch of forecasts. These are publicly available. They predict the spread of hospitalizations, ICU uh, admissions, confirmed cases, um, it is trained using public data only. There is no Google specific secret source involved. The models are also uh, described on um, our archive papers, which are publicly available. We have a NeurIPS uh, paper as well and a Nature publication in, in the works. So yeah, so essentially we want to, like I said, the goal was to ensure that this model was not just a black box ML model, but something that we could provide to epidemiologist and they would be able to peek into the model to understand if it made sense. So um, again, uh, continuing with the theme of what we did, we provided a white paper. We have these public data sets. We also publish the entire data set um, as part of the query. So you can actually download the CSV file. Our forecasts are part of the national response portal. This is um, something that uh, the federal government set up together to uh, estimate the spread of the disease. And it's it's basically a collection of a bunch of models that come together to predict where things are going. And, and there is some evidence to indicate that this combined model is actually much better than e any of these individual models. And very importantly, we also published uh, evidence on fairness analysis. We know this disease has disproportionately affected people of color. And therefore it was very important for us to ensure that um, the error rates that we, are uh, that we have for a model are not favoring uh, favoring communities of uh, uh, favoring or like uh, disadvantaging communities of color in any way. So part of this work was also in publishing this fairness analysis to indicate to to prove that this model was truly fair. 
And like I said, the biggest um, challenges in the space was integrating human expertise. Like this is the hard, this is the hard part of AI. You, you, you can solve a black, you can create a black box model that will probably outperform a bunch of models, but there is very little information to get out, to make it interpretable, understandable, and get a sense semblance of confidence on the system. So uh, this was the biggest challenge to start out with. The second challenge was the environment was changing continuously. And there were like, the, the changing environment is uh, very relevant because environments change not just because of interventions like policy decisions, people putting in, um, people putting in restrictions like mobility restrictions where they, they have a lock, lock in, lockdown in place or the curfews or like business specific, like all restaurants should need to be closed or daycares need to be closed. And these were changing and they were not only just changing um, by like the country, they were changing by state, by county. So even when there were policies at the top level, the, the level at which they were enforced were very different. So this made this disease very difficult because there is no uniform data set that informs A, is the policy in, in place? Has it been enforced? So we had to imply a lot of this information. Uh, and then there were many data sets because of this, um, epidemic, there were so many data sets published, the hard, one of the big challenges was figuring out which data sets to use. And, uh, and as you'll see later on, one of the analysis that one of our problems was we could get in a lot of data sets and essentially build a very complex model and overfit. So we had to do like fancy regularization techniques to ensure that we were not creating uh, 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 an overly uh, over-parameterized model. And there was one thing unique about this data set, which is about the disease itself, which is the undocumented cases. So most disease, when you try to model them, you have a good sense like Ebola or any of these diseases, you have a good sense of the number of people that are potentially susceptible to the disease, how many are exposed, how many are infected at a given point in time, because any, anybody who usually gets exposed gets uh, or, or infected it gets hospitalized. But in the case of the COVID virus, it was asymptomatic, which made it really difficult to have a sense of what are the true number of people who are affected and not having good data as inputs can make a lot of models like bad with their outputs, garbage in, garbage out. So yeah, so data sources were noisy, again, due to collection issues. Uh, noisy is a very, what should I say, uh, a generous term. The, they were noisy to the point where uh, they were restating ground truths every day. So what happens is the New York Times or GHU were the most famous data sets. When they published their results, they would publish, they would publish data for, from this point to the past right up to the 22nd of January. And very often if you compare the data sets, yesterday's ground truth for all of these days to today's ground truth for all of these days, except that one day that you got today, the new additional day, you would see there are huge differences. And this was a problem because the authorities were restating ground truth all the time. They were going back and saying, oh, this death that was attributed to COVID is not actually a COVID death, or this death that was not attributed is now a COVID death. So the ground truth not only was shifting, it was shifting not for every single day in the future, like going forward, but every single day in the past. This was a big challenge. And um, if anybody's interested, I'm happy to talk about how we had to tackle this problem. But this resulted in very fundamental philosophical questions like, uh, should we build a model that looks good 14 days from now, 28 days from now, five years from now, because they are, they are all different problems. So let me talk about traditional epidemiology to get to provide some motivation about how epidemiologists think about the spread of a, uh, a disease. So today the gold standard is something called the SEIR model. S stands for susceptible, E stands for exposed, I is for infectious, and R is for removed or recovered. So uh, people use different terms depending upon whom you're talking to, but usually it is recovered for the most part. So these models are essentially, you can think of them as compartments. So you can think of when the COVID pandemic started, the entire population say of the US was in the susceptible bucket. Some, some, some portion of them were exposed. 
and some people were infectious and some people had recovered from the, um, from the disease. And you can think of these people transitioning from these boxes at any given point in time. So you go from susceptible to exposed to infectious to removed or recovered. So what the SCIR model tries to do is provide these, given this SCIR model, you can specify these different rates. And this was a nice visualization provided by the New York Times, where you could actually go in and take a look and, and specify the populations. You can see the size of the population as input, the basic reprodu reproduction number, which basically controls how many from susceptible go to exposed. And all of these parameters are essentially controlling the rate at which things go from one compartment to the next. So you can see over here, susceptible is basically um, RT, which is at time zero, uh, at, at any given point in time with the, with the entire population. Exposed is basically the set of people who are in, uh, is a set of transitions of people getting out of exposed, the exposed compartment, minus the ones coming in. That's a set of people in, in the recovered compartment. And if you look at the differential equation for infected, it's the same thing. It's, just, it's the number of people coming in minus the number of people coming out of the compartment. So this is a very simple model, but it has worked remarkably, remarkably well. And some problems with this model is these, um, I'll touch upon this later as well, is that these parameters, these R0, these transmission rates are effectively static. So you can say at this point in time, this is how we believe the disease is going to progress. The problem is this only is a point in time accurate. This is not accurate going forward. For instance, you can predict one peak and one, one bump, like one peak, just one single peak using the standard SER model. But as we know, the disease progresses, spreads, slows down and spreads again. And that is not very easy to capture. So you, what you really want to do is be able to capture these, these variables dynamically in terms of time, i.e. these parameters, these transmission rates that we have for these compartments need to be um, dynamic and not static. And that's what, that's what was our big insight. Essentially, we, we, we took the compartmental model and asked the question, can we learn these transmission rates? given the data. And we built our own version of the compartmental model that learned these transmission rates dynamically over time and, um, and predicted where things are going to be. So if you, if you take a look at our compartmental model, you can see it has a standard buckets of susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. But you'll also notice we have something called documented infected and undocumented infected because it's a special for COVID because the number of undocumented infected cases was significantly larger than, than the number of documented infected cases. So we built this fancy model and we added a bunch of new compartments. And this is primarily because we were trying to inform, uh, inform bits, bits and pieces about um, uh, hospital hospitalization supply chain issues, where supplies are needed, where we believe there's going to be a next hike. And we are informing policy for various state governments. So, so this is the reason we had this very specialized compartment on ventilators, ICU and hospitalized and death as well. So um, often we did not have all of the data and which in which case, when we didn't have the data, we used to basically just drop those compartments off and just use a simpler uh, compartment just with death. So you can see all of these rates over here. They're very similar to the previous um, differential equations, equation model that you saw. And essentially these are parameters that provide, inf uh, that provide information over the rate of transmission from one compartment to the next. And all of these variables are then uh, calculated based on covariates like mobility, the changes in mobility, uh, census, and even the, the progression of the disease itself. So I can provide a lot more information about these compartments if there is any interest, but this is, this, um, this diagram effectively represents our model and everything else from here is just going to be explaining about the different aspects of how these things, like how we went about doing these things. So if anybody has any questions, this would be a good time to pause and take any questions. Hey Vic, so there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, oh, I I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, I'm not been paying attention to the chat. Uh, 
let me open that up quickly. Sure, I, I could also share. Oh, that... um, I, I, I'll, I'll open up the chat. Okay. I think that will be easier. I am. I have not done this before, so I'm trying to figure out where I see these questions. You know what? I'm going to take your offer and okay. have you screen share and answer those questions. Let me stop sharing. Sure. Yeah. Um, right. So, a question from Mark: uh, Did the? I guess these are more general. I don't know if they're totally related to the compartmentalization. But um, the first question: Did the changes in the CDC reporting hamper your work at all? Um, they had significant consequences. I think um, initially we did not recognize the, the amount of change that was happening to the ground truth. And it was a while later that we realized, oh my God, the ground truth under us is shifting quite a bit. And that was a wake up call for us because we realized uh, when you're doing model comparisons, you, you compare this week's model using, you'll build a model using this, this week's data, uh, provide evaluation metrics. Next week, you'll repeat the same process, but using the latest ground truth. And because you're using the latest ground truth and the ground truth used for both these models are completely different, they're actually not comparable. So we ended up making some bad choices and our modeling decisions because of this. But once we caught up to this, that the, um, that the quality of, once, the quality, once we realized that this is happening and we can't control for it, we basically decided to, basic, uh, to check mark our, um, our ground truth at any given point in time. So if you have a new model, and if you're comparing two models, we ensured that the inputs, the ground truth inputs for them were exactly using the same as of the day that the previous model was um, evaluated. So, so that was one big problem for us. It slowed us down quite a bit. And this was right before we were going to publish. So it was a good catch. It was before we published and before it was embarrassing that Google published results that were not like, that models were that were not like truly, essentially what would result if we did that was our models in production would not be, uh, uh, our validation um, evaluation would not be comparable to what would happen in production. So it was, it was nice we caught it and fixed that early on. Great. Um, another question from Matthew, uh, what regularization techniques did you use? So we had to use, um, so I, I, I don't think I can fully answer this question, but um, we did, uh, we had a statistician on the team who did this. And I can provide some slides about uh, information about which limited, we had to select, we, we had to be very judicious in our choice of the parameters we use for the model, because like I said, we could use a ton of data sets and then overfit on these parameters. And we had to be a judicious in the selection. And then even um, after that, during uh, a model um, evaluation itself, we had significant, we, uh, uh, at the start of the project, we used a significant amount of L1 and L2 loss. I, I don't know what else, it, it has changed since then. So I have not looked at the model since then. So I don't know what the current one is. So the next question is from Conrad who says, have we decided what the ground truth um, for what a COVID death is? many of the deaths attributed to COVID are from underlying conditions. So this is a lack, so, so we trust the information provided by JHU and um, the NY Times. We, we don't know their process of de determining whether the death was caused by COVID or underlying conditions. So the, um, both the JHU and, and New York Times include this information and I believe they line up very well. So I don't know what mechanism it is, but it seems to be that um, even though there are independent agencies providing this ground truth, there is some standard. I'm not aware of what it is. I guess this is a related question from Mike, but how you tackled the problem of inaccuracy with data in your model. Um. <laughs> uh, this was... Um, so we worked around this by basically building a more robust model and, and robust in the sense that is something that is understandable by experts. 
So given our model, we could actually take out the parameters, the learned parameters and hand it to an expert and which we did with um, uh, professors at Harvard. And they would look at this model and say, these parameters make sense or they do not make sense. So even though our uh, models were learned using data, the output was actually uh, an epidemiological model that people could work with. And they didn't care about really how this model was generated. The accuracy of the model was more important and building this epidemiological model that people today hand code without, with just like absolutely no expertise. In a sense, you don't know what the parameter value should be for these models. So they, they, they fit these parameters based on what they are observing. And part of the problem with the COVID virus was there was very little confidence on the quality of the data. And therefore, building a model that also accounted for this was, I think, um, the game changer, essentially. That was the biggest, the novel contribution of our work, being able to take ML and apply it to an epidemiolo epidemiological model and then use that epidemiological model for forecasting. Hope that helps. Yeah, um, a question from, let's see. David, um, are the SEIR variables continuous or discrete? So um, by variables, I assume you mean the transmission, um, uh, the, the rate variables, essentially. Those are uh, continuous. Um, Mark asks, can you speak about COVID-19 deaths and excess deaths? Um, is this... I'm not sure what this is. Maybe could maybe Mark could elaborate a bit more on the question. Um, somebody had done a study um, about excess deaths, some, uh, deaths that were not directly attributable to COVID-19, and they included several different categories of um, uh, related heart and because because the ACE. Uh, the, the ACE protein was used or the ACE receptor was used um, uh, by the uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, virus, they, they included, okay, we're going to include deaths from um, uh, pulmonary, dis pulmonary disorders and renal disorders and, and look for excess deaths. And uh, as of November 2020, there were 300,000 um, excess deaths or, or 299,000, uh, excess deaths. But I didn't know if you, if you could speak to the excess deaths versus, uh, confirmed. No, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I was not aware of the, the excess deaths being provided as a statistic or, um, would you know what a good data source for this information is? Uh, well, okay. Well, while you're talking, I'll see if I can find it. I'll post it in the chat. Yeah. So, so fundamentally, the problem was because these deaths were being reported on a daily basis and there was not good quality. That is what is resulting in this three statements going back into the past all the time. And that was fundamentally, uh, that was the fundamental problem. And that was something that we caught early. And we were also able to inform the general academic community because we were not the only ones making this mistake. Turns out um, there were a bunch of places that were pro providing these aggregate information and we we were part of those m multiple consortiums and we were able to publish and ex expose this problem to a lot of uh, other teams. But I don't think there is a good way for us to identify this without going down to like the personal, uh, like down to the data and hospitals that were actually reporting this information. And I think, yeah, I, I, I can't add more than that. Um, so, uh, I just posted something from JAMA. And it shows their, it shows their methodologies. I see. This is interesting. Thank you. Uh, but, I, I, but, but, but I was, I've been looking for something that covered after November or after October, whatever, whatever it was. And I really haven't seen an update, um, to that study. I see yeah, I'm, this is this is new for me as well. So I think I'm going to have to spend some time looking at this myself. It will be <laughs> useful feedback for us to think through. Thank okay, I, 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 just, I didn't want to sidetrack your presentation, but but I thought it 
you know, if you'd also looked at that, it may, it may have been insightful. Yeah, especially, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. This is something useful to think about. And I can provide some insights going down as we go forward about how we perform, provide different kinds of supervision to the model as well. So this is one example of supervision we could provide, but I don't know how good the data is. We need to look at the data. So uh, I, I'll use another example as part of this. So let me go back to the presentation. Share screen. All right, so here we were describing um, the, the SEIR model. And like I mentioned, um, we did a bunch of additional things like, and um, so, so in this case, we, what we're highlighting is we were thinking about reinfections well before we had multiple variants. So you can see we had a rate variable that went from recovered back to susceptible. This means you could potentially, this also helped with the vaccination example where we knew we were going to have vaccines with some efficacy percentage. Like when we are doing some what if scenarios, you're thinking about 70%. Well, it would be awesome. And <laughs> we ended up getting vaccines with 90. That was, that was great. But this would provide this kind of information where you, you would only have 70% um, actually recovered. So you would have roughly 30% probability of still transitioning to susceptible. So we could also control these variables without um, providing any addition. We could learn these variables, how well the vaccination was progressing in a population and stuff like that using by studying these different variables. Yeah, and this talks about the process of how we basically used time varying functions to basically learn these various um, uh, transition functions. I'm going to skip on the slide. Yeah, and uh, like I said, uh, one of the biggest learnings from this uh, exercise was A, we, were, we built all of this infrastructure on, Google, on um, GCP, which is Google's external cloud infrastructure and not internal to Google. And the intent for that was because this was A, academic for the most part. And B, uh, we also wanted to test out how well external data sources worked. And it was a great learning experience, but we also learned the hard way maintaining data quality is hard. And uh, keeping tabs and checks on data quality was one of the harder problems that we had because you could have changes day to day where suddenly you would have uh, no, no reports and then they would just report zeros. And you would just be like, the model would be confused because it's like, it's been predicting uh, cumulative deaths so far up to like um, some number N and suddenly the next day drops to zero and cumulative curves don't go down, like they always go up. So that was like, like fixing these kinds, identifying these data qualities and fixing them was hard. Historical data quality was a big problem. There would be dips even in these cumulative curves, which made no sense. So we had to put uh, like sanity checks in place, model, catching issues with model quality. Like when you're de dealing with time series forecasting, a one-off issue can be very serious because you can then leak uh, labels into your forecasts. That's never a good idea. And then infrastructure, because uh, we built, we were probably one of the biggest users of, uh, of ML GCP on Google at the time at which we went public. That, that's because we are doing so much hyperparameter optimization. We basically, um, we, we basically almost caused an outage in one of the regions, which was fun. Yeah, and you can look at the quality of our predictions. These are like a few cherry picked examples. We, on average, we, are, we, we do much better than most models, especially models where, especially for states with um, large populations. Uh, you, you can see over here, the, the, the light, the, the dotted lines are our predictions and the ones with the crosses are the actual ground truth. And you can see the, the, these two curves, the green curves are usually close to each other in, in, for the most part. And this is the state level model. We also had a county level model. So um, here, uh, here are another example. So, so one thing that was also special about our model was most models predict an independent curve for deaths and independent curve for ground truths for like confirmed cases we were able to predict using one model, all of these parameters. So it was 
a single model generating all parameters versus other black box models that you, you generally had independent models predicting deaths, another model predicting ground truth, which made it even more difficult, sorry, difficult to reason with. Um, yes, and then we also had county level models. So an example of where we use supervision was, so, so our county, so we, I believe, were one of very few models that provided county level um, forecasts. And this was very important, especially at the county level and state level, city level for making decisions. The city of New York actually was one of our, um, I cannot talk about this, I'm sorry. Um, I am going to skip over this, but essentially um, the predictions at the county level were very high quality. And the reason for that was we were able to build models at the state level and the state level models were really good. They worked, they were comparable to some of the best models out there. And at any given point in time, the best model, we, we were in the top five models at any given point in time. But a county level models was almost always usually the best. And that's because we provided supervision to the county level models such that like the sum of all counties should not like significantly exceed the state level models prediction. So we would basically train a state level model and then use that state level model to supervise the county level model, which was which helped us like improve our county level performance significantly. There's still some issues you as you will realize county level models are not are going to be very noisy, as you can see in these examples over here. But usually we were on, we were the best county model out there at any given point in time. All right, so yeah, and like I said, we were able to provide these transition parameters at any given point in time with, with experts, and they were able to provide us feedback and help A, improve the quality of our model, but B, also inform policy decisions downstream. Um, the second bit was understanding of uh, like, because we had an interpretable, interpretable model, we could actually take a look down into the details about how each of these input covariates were affecting uh, the spread of the disease. So in this case, we plotted different, uh, different graphs. So you can see like on the 24th of May, uh, 24th of May, 2020, it was uh, the, the red line indicates shelter in place. So shelter in place policies gained importance, but they dropped in importance over time. And you, you can do this for all of these various metrics. So uh, here's another example where you can see the importance for shelter in place dropping and the importance for confirmed and the ground truth improving. And when ground truth becomes important, that's an indication that uh, the model is biasing information like uh, trend level information or like people call these momentum information more highly compared to other covariates like mobility. And that's also because at different points in time, people were introducing these mask mandates. So suddenly when earlier in the spread of the disease, mobility was really important. As time went, mobility became less important. And this was evident in our models. And this was, you could see as mask mandates came in, mobility took uh, less of an importance and these other interventions like closures for businesses, closure, different kinds of interventions that we had data for start taking precedence. And yeah, uh, so, so that was very useful, not just for us, but also for policymakers to see their decisions actually taking effect. And finally, like a, this is a small slide on fairness analysis. And you can see that on average, a mean absolute error was usually less than 1%. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of confounding factors over here, I should add with a caveat, which is um, our populations are not very well mixed. That means generally what we've observed was um, the, um, uh, the black population tends to be in larger cities and we do well in larger cities versus uh, rural areas. So a lot of these biases are like confounded with a lot of other, uh, there are a lot of other confounding factors but on average, we were able to keep our, we were able to observe very similar errors across all demographics. And I'm happy to talk about the computer infrastructure, but uh, let's just say we were doing a lot at any given point. There were points in time when we were using over a hundred thousand VMs to run uh, hyperparameter tuning. Um, we were so big at one point in time that they basically had to um, uh, set up machines 
uh, at a data center to help keep uh, keep our in our project going. So this was a fun project. I'm happy to talk about stories over there. For the most part, uh, we used BigQuery and Kubeflow. If people are uh, not, um, I'm happy to provide like uh, details on both of these if there is interest. Uh, I'll take them towards the end with questions. And we have a, a bunch of learnings over here. Um, a, we liked solving. A, this was very uh, satisfying because we solved an important problem and we helped inform policy. That was a big win for us, All also while getting a good rep for Google through this whole process. Um, we were super users for Google and learning about like large, and it's good to be able to build these large systems without having, having to actually know the details of how it is actually done. So that was like super nice. This is the first time I actually built something outside of Google and we were able to build a phenomenally complex system without knowing the details of how things work, which was uh, really nice. Um, again, then the last thing was a focus on launching responsibly. That was a great learning experience because uh, there were points in time where we really wanted to launch and we like, like we identified the issues with the ground truth. And this was, um, this helped us also cement a solid rep in, uh, in the academic space because we were able to push for uh, ideas most people were not thinking of well ahead of um, the crowd. And that helped improve not just our forecasting capabilities, but for the entire community and um, uh, all, uh, all of the CDC as well. And like I said, fairness was on top of mind. This is something we baked into our models early on to avoid, um, e even though it is very tempting to include, um, uh, to include more demographic information, knowing that demographics helps better predict, um, help with better prediction. It was really hard to balance those two. And we kept this in mind throughout. And that was one of the things that helped eventually land a model that we know for a fact was fair. And then finally, we had to answer like hard philosophical questions like, should we publish this now or publish it until we have more confidence in the quality of models? Because there's always this factor that by pushing out these forecasts early, you help save lives, help make better policy decisions versus, yeah, that was, a, that was I think one of the hard problems that as an engineer, you want to build a perfect system while at the same time you have a pandemic ongoing and you want to launch quickly. So we have, we've we spent a, a bunch of nights going through, uh, getting things up and running, knowing the, uh, the cost of dealer. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it from me. And I think I'm also on time. So I'm going to stop and maybe take a few minutes if there are any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Vic. So Vic, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about all the predictions you were making and working with other folks. Did you pay much attention to thinking about causality in the modeling you were doing? Because some of the fundamental questions are, you know, your projections are causal in nature and or the actions are causal in nature. And I was curious what you thought about that. Yeah, so that is where the having a, a standard epidemiological model in hand came uh, came very handy, because uh, even though we can't predict causality and causality is is a is a brutally hard problem, because we had a, a epidemiological model, we didn't need to explain causality as long as we could show these are the learned parameters, and this is just replacing humans who would have been plugging in those parameters to figure out what to do next. This was just a machine figuring out those parameters learning those parameters and providing them. So because we had this existing framework that we could plug into, we didn't have to answer this question of causality. So essentially the, the model captured the, the expertise for the humans and they could infer causality out of it. So no, so to answer your question, no, we did not try to answer causality and we know it's a, uh, it's a very hard problem. Any other questions? Uh, I think Matthew, you had a few um, in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll let you speak for those. Oh, okay. Um, 
Yeah, first of all, just uh, more details about uh, the model, uh, if you could. Um, I mean, it seems like you just had a handful or a few dozen parameters. Um, and it looked like it's a differentiable model. So I guess you're doing a gradient descent there to learn those. All right. OK, so then I got us. Why did you need six trillion petawatts of compute for a model with a few dozen parameters? I got a hard time getting my head around that. So, so the complexity was not in the parameters themselves. The par each of these parameters were being learned, and each of these parameters were being learned simultaneously in the same graph. That was the complexity. Essentially, being able to train each for each time step, you would basically train all of these independent um, variables roll the graph one step forward, repeat the same process, and you'd repeat this time step for each for okay. each time step. That would be just one run. And you would do this maybe a, uh, 500 times with different hyperparameters. So that would give you one trained model. Okay. Right? And when you're doing modeling, when you're doing like, like five or six people are trying out different ideas, let's use this covariate. We are a team of almost 30 engineers. So all of these 30 engineers say trying out just one idea means 30 of these runs, 30 of these 500 um, uh, parameter runs, that's 1500 runs. Each of these 15, like of these 1500 runs, you can imagine each run is taking about uh, 100 machines. You can easily see how, e you can see how much, how quickly you can cross that barrier for 100,000 machines. Yeah, so it does, does sound like just an overfitting nightmare. Um, and I guess you had to bend over backwards to make sure that wasn't happening. I mean, there's huge potential for Yes, so that is where the regularization and the judicious use of um, which which data do we use to calculate for which um, which variables, which transmission variables was the key. Yeah, I assume you guys did that did that right. And then the, I guess the other question I had was, um, you showed a feature a slide 19 was a feature importance. Uh, you showed the relative feature importance, but you would have had to have done some kind of normalization of the weights. Yes. So I'm wondering yes. how you how you did that. So all of the weights that we, um, the, all of the weights in our model were eventually normalized as inputs between zero, or minus one and plus one. And then we knew because everything is normalized in the same range, we knew sure. which parameters was equal. And then we know which parameters weighted higher, which would tell us which right. one. And, and so how did, you, how did you put them into that zero to negative one to one range? Uh, this is just standard uh, normalization techniques that we used. Uh, that wasn't is, did you did you z-score them? Is is that what you're saying? I mean, you just oh, I mean, oh. z-scoring you can z-score input data. That's standard normalization. But but normalizing parameters, there's I'm not aware of standard normalization. So uh, uh, to to give you a concrete example, um, you can think of uh, population as uh, so everything was normalized a by population. So you if you have like area as an example, so you're cal cal calculating density metrics. Uh, so um, you would basically normalize that A by population first and then uh, normalize this. I do not know the answer. So normalization differed depending upon the kind of parameter you're normalizing. for. Right, so I mean, just, just to, here's a point. You, you should, one of your covariates was the presence of um, a stay-at-home mandate, right? Yeah. So, so that's, like a, that's like a binary value right. parameter. And then you're comparing that on the same graph with something like population density, right? Which is a right. scalar continuous variable, right? And, and so, you know, you, you're, you're, now you can do, it can be done, but it's non-trivial to, to make a, a valid comparison between those. I'm, yeah, just wondering. How, yes, how um, uh, I was not the one who did that comparison. Okay. I can look yeah, into that fine. and provide more details, sure. but sure. I can, uh, yeah. Okay, you did it somehow. Okay, thank yeah. you. Anyone else? Uh, hi, Vic. Uh, nice presentation. I have a quick question, and I might have missed this. Uh, you mentioned about fairness. Um, I wanted to ask, did you explicitly did do anything to, to enforce the fairness other than, let's say, not use demographic information or things like that? Um, no. So that is actually one of the questions you asked as part of our fairness analysis. We, um, we initially we were planning to use like demographic, demographic information. Uh, the model showed better results, but we ended up not using it eventually. Um, uh, this, but again, like I said, this was a, at a point in time, I don't know how that decision would have changed, like uh, how that would have affected the model later on. But I yeah, see. that was one of the things we actively did not include. 
Um, there were other um, questions about Ferris is hard because of the number of confounders. So even though we know for a fact that uh, the model is uh, on average less than one percent MAE, it is not. It is non-trivial to take out the effects purely based on uh, race. So we understand the limitations, and I, I, this is something that we even discuss in the paper. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, where can we read the conclusions drawn from your study if you have a URL? I can post the archive and then Europe's paper. Sweet. So I'll post those in the chat um, and you, you should be able to access them. Cool. Yeah. If um, Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. If, if nothing else, we can move on to um, our next talk. Let me share my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I can see it okay. Cool. Um, our next speaker is Nisarg. Uh, Nisarg has a PhD in computer science from Duke University. Um, and since then he has been an ML engineer at LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, and he's currently working as a senior software engineer um, at Emerald Innovations. So, Sark, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, thanks. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to this uh, forum. Um, um, I'm going to talk about uh, how do we protect secrets in the data using adversarial nets. And this is um, a joint work that I did when I was at Duke doing my PhD uh, with uh, Ashwin, Landon, and Jerry. Um, so it's a collaborative effort. Um, and feel free to stop and ask questions if you have any, um, because I can't see the chats right now. Um, okay, so, so this is a very simplified view of what an ML lifecycle looks like. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it. Uh, we have a training data set, we apply some ML algorithms and we get a model out of it. And then you have a second step where you deploy this model and use it to run inference on new data points. So there are a bunch of privacy problems that occur across these phases. Um, I'll stick to the phase where we deploy the model and when we run the inference on the new data points, how do we protect sensitive information in the new data points? Um, there is a host of uh, research on how do we protect the information in the training data itself? And how do we make sure that the model itself does not leak information about the training data? And that's a separate topic. Um, okay, so to build um, some groundwork and motivation towards why this is important, um, user data is extremely important to provide any service, um, be it an autonomous driving, a text translation app, or security apps. So like you, you need user data at every moment to do something about it. So like in autonomous driving case, you capture the information continuously from your surrounding. You do detections like detecting the lanes, detecting the pedestrians and so on. And all of these data is collected, analyzed, and um, it produces some useful output that the application relies on. And nowadays, uh, the one model of uh, the apps is that you collect information from user and their surroundings, and then ship that data onto the cloud where you have giant machine learning models crunching uh, that information and spitting some output. And that output is then used to take some actions or um, give some information to the user back. 
the problem with this is that um, um, you might uh, lose some privacy and you might uh, leak some information that you don't want to. So, so let's take a very concrete example of a driver safety app. Um, imagine you have a dashboard cam that's continuously monitoring driver. And uh, the idea is that you want to analyze the frames and figure out whether the driver is paying attention or uh, not. So in order to do that, one way to do is you capture the frames, you run some ML model to detect activities like whether the person is texting, uh, whether the person is looking down and so on. Um, so I call these sort of information as app essential, app essential information um, that's necessary for app to function. Um, but at the same time, you are also revealing sensitive information because the same image can be used to analyze information like an identity of a person or race or gender. So I call these information as private information. Um, now, most of the apps do collect user information at a large scale, and then they analyze them to, to give useful information. Uh, but at the same time, you can have a risk of either maliciously or accidentally leaking sensitive information in the data that's being collected. So, um, I mean, we will go back to this example often as we go along the presentation, and that will be used as an anchor point to understand how, what are the problems and how do we solve it? So a simple solution is why don't we keep the user data on the device? Like um, we instead bring back the model on the device instead of cloud, do not send any data on the cloud, do all the processing on the, on the device itself. And that is indeed being done at many cases like TensorFlow Lite is an example where the push is to do on-device computation. And not only it has benefits in terms of privacy, but it also has benefits in terms of uh, response time because you don't have to send everything to the cloud and you can just do the computation on the fly. However, in, in, in practice that's limited because um, the devices are not that great in terms of resources. You have a capacity, uh, so you have a limitation on the capacity at, to which you can do the computation. And uh, you can also have problems like you can have proprietary models that uh, you don't want to ship it to the device and the models are continuously changing uh, and it's hard. So, uh, and the last problem is you eventually need to trust the app because from user's perspective, the apps are black box and you don't know what the app is doing internally. So even if uh, you could have a malicious app that claims to be doing on-device processing, but can still send data out there on the cloud. So what we propose is, is we want to obfuscate the data before it reaches the app so that we don't need to trust the app and uh, we don't need to bring the model on the device. Uh, the idea is it should work seamlessly. Um, having said that, there are, uh, and again, um, the, the work we did applies to data that's beyond images, like it applies to sensor data as well, but throughout the presentation, I'll stick to images because it's easier to explain. So in, in case of, image in particular, you could apply some naive obfuscation techniques like you can blur the image, you can do pixelation where you hide the sensitive information. And the problem is problems with these approaches are that uh, you have to balance between privacy and utility. So uh, if you blur too much, you lose the utility because those images will be useless. And if you blur too little, then you have a risk of uh, revealing information. In fact, the there are like a lot of work that shows that even if you blur to some extent, you can still identify information uh, using state-of-the-art neural network models. Um, mainly because it doesn't hide all the information, and the other reason is there is also a context. So you can hide a face, but then the surroundings, like the people who you are with, the location, and all those information can be used to actually pinpoint you. So those are the main challenges of these naive obfuscation mechanisms. So we we basically, so this is a prob, concrete problem statement, right? You, we want to construct an obfuscation mechanism 
that hides private information in the user data with a minimal impact on the app's utility. So the idea, again, going back to the driver safety app is that we want to put the obfuscator in between the sensor and the app so that once you obfuscate the data, the app can still function on the obfuscated data, meaning it can still identify uh, the activities such as texting, um, whether the hands are on the wheel and so on. But at the same time, it should not be able to identify sensitive information such as race or gender or identity. So this is what we refer to as utility aware obfuscation. Um, so the rest of the talk is outlined as follows. We'll first uh, describe how do we come up with such an obfuscation mechanism. Then I'll talk about Olympus, which is the framework that uses these principles to build an obfuscation mechanism. Uh, and then finally, I'll describe a bunch of evaluation results that we uh, did to evaluate how good the Olympus works in real life. Um, any questions before I move on? Okay, so let's see. Um, so here is the idea behind the whole work. The, we, we are proposing to use neural networks to learn as well as verify the obfuscation. Uh, neural networks are universal approximator, so meaning uh, they can be used to approximate a lot of different functions um, with certain constraints. And the, the idea here is that why can't we use neural network to also learn the obfuscation mechanism that satisfies our criteria. Now, once we learn such a mechanism, we also want to verify whether that particular mechanism is valid or not. So we also use a neural network to verify that information. And it might uh, look uh, odd, but that works. Uh, basically, you, you have these two networks that compete each with each other. And in doing so, they actually come up with the best possible obfuscation mechanism. So to understand this, uh, how do we do this? Let's look at the concept of generative adversarial networks or popularly known as GAN. And um, I apologize if you already know about it, but let me give you a very brief uh, idea of what it is and how it works. So the goal here is you want to learn a particular distribution that the data is following. And the popular use case is you want to be able to generate realistic images. So the, the way is you have a generator, which is a neural network. You feed in a random noise to the generator. And then the generator's goal is to output the data point. And in case of images, it, it tries to output the image that looks realistic. Now, how do we verify this? Well, you add another network, which is called a discriminator that takes in this generated data, we call it also fake data, and a real data point. And it tries to identify whether the given data point is real or fake. So in some sense, it's, it's, it's a binary classification problem. Um, now, in doing so, it helps the generator to learn to produce realistic data. Basically, you feed that loss uh, back to the discriminator and generator. And the idea is that let's call this loss as the, in some sense, typically it's a cross entropy loss, but at a very high level, it's trying to capture how well the discriminator is able to distinguish between real and fake data point. So the goal of the discriminator is to minimize that loss, meaning it's it should improve the accuracy of distinguishing between real and generated data. And the goal of the generator is, is opposite, meaning it tries to maximize that loss. So in other words, it tries to fool the discriminator. So eventually, it, it, it's like a game. They both uh, go um, iteratively. We train them iteratively. And eventually, the generator will be able to generate the data point that is indistinguishable from the real data point. So at some point, the discriminators will reach to a stage where it cannot identify 
what's real and what's generated. And this is popularly known as minimax optimization problem. And um, we can have iterative methods to reach equilibrium in some cases. Of course, it requires a lot of training data and uh, computations, but uh, it has been shown that this is possible. So how do we use this idea? Well, we, we thought that in our case, instead of generating a real data point, we would like to remove sensitive information from the data. So what we do is instead of having a generator generate a real data point, we call it an obfuscator. And instead of giving a random input, we are giving the original input, like original data point, and asking it to remove private information from the data. Well, how do we first uh, train such thing and really make it remove the private information? And the second, how do we ensure that it is indeed removing private information? So to do that, just like in GAN, you use discriminator to verify that the generated data is real. We also use another discriminator, if you call it, we call it attacker, which tries to find private information in the data. And the goal of the attacker is to be able to break the obfuscation. And we capture it through the attacker's accuracy or privacy loss. And then this loss is given back to the obfuscator so that the obfuscator can learn its mistakes and then figure out what went wrong and in the next iteration, fix it. So in the same way we do in GAN, this is slightly different use uh, framework, but the, the underlying principle is same where the obfuscator tries to hide private information and the attacker tries to infer the private information. And then whatever loss you get from the attacker, you feed it back to the obfuscator so that the obfuscator will um, improve. So the goal of the obfuscator is to minimize privacy loss, but the goal of the attacker is to maximize privacy loss. And we come up with the same kind of minimax optimization problem that we can solve iteratively. So far, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, the problem is this is trivially solvable. You can just output a blank image or like constant data point, and then you don't have any private information in this. But that's clearly useless because we, we, we want a utility out of the data as well. So how do we do this? Well, the first attempt we tried is to say that, why don't we make sure that the input of the obfuscator and the output looks similar? So basically we force them to be as close as possible. And the, the idea behind this is that we want the obfuscator to remove the private information without changing the data too much. So, so in, in, in practice, what we hoped was to, okay, if you see something sensitive, remove it, but then keep everything else because that's that might be required for uh, the downstream applications. The benefit of this approach was you are not app dependent. You can basically make sure that it works with many different applications. However, in practice, when we actually apply this technique and when we trained it, we it turned out that the it was very hard to train such an obfuscator, um, mainly because the private information and the public informations are, can be very tightly coupled. Uh, for example, again going back to the driver safety app, you can imagine that the facial expression that uh, or facial features can be used to identify whether the person is looking straight or looking down. Um, on the other hand, this can also be used to identify a race or gender. So changing those things uh, is necessary for preserving the privacy, but it's bad for preserving the utility. So that was the problem. And in, in data points like images, you have these uh, structure and uh, enforcing that the input and output looks same. Uh, also enforces that you have to keep that structure. And because of that, it was very hard to break this correlation, which was necessary to hide private information, but really uh, keep the useful information. So then we thought that, okay, let's put a constraint on it and say that we are going to build an obfuscation mechanism for a particular app or 
uh, the model within the app that uses the data. And in doing so, we were able to use the app or its model to train our office data. So now we added app into the picture. And when I say app, I really mean the model that's used by the app. Um, so that we feed the obfuscated data to the app's model. And then whatever error we get from the model, we call it the utility loss and then give that loss back to the obfuscator. So now the obfuscator has both privacy loss and utility loss. And the goal is now to minimize both of these losses. So by minimizing privacy loss, you are trying to hide private information. And by minimizing utility loss, you are trying to keep app essential information. Um, so this is the summary of the approach. Well, you have three components. You have an obfuscator, we have an attacker, and we have an app. And the goal is that we, the obfuscator should learn to remove the private information, but keep the app essential, app essential information. And that's captured through this optimization function. Um, we do linear combination of uh, privacy loss and utility loss with the parameter k so that you can balance privacy and utility. Um, and then the attacker is trained to maximize the privacy loss so that it can then lead the obfuscator to actually learn the obfuscation. The app is simply used to compute the utility loss. We do not touch I mean, we do not train an uh, apps model or do anything with it. It's just used to compute the utility loss so that we ensure that the obfuscator can keep app essential information. Um, the benefits of this approach is like, you have sort of app compatibility in a sense that whatever obfuscation mechanism you are going to come up with will work with the app without changing anything in the app. All we need is access to the model, um, and as long as we have that, um, we, we, we ensure that the obfuscation mechanism is work, will work with the app without changing anything. Uh, we have verifiable op obfuscation. Um, it's in a, this is not a strictly theoretical sense verifiability, but it's more like one practical side where since we use this attacker model to ensure that the private information is hidden, Eventually, when the iterative optimization is reached, reaches the equilibrium, we know that the attacker is not going to be able to identify any private information. And not only this attacker, but any class of these attackers will have the same property. And we show that in the experiments that uh, whatever obfuscation mechanism we come up with do, uh, does protect against a uh, class of adversaries. Third, we can um, have privacy utility trade-off. As I mentioned that sometimes the private information and use utility information are very tightly coupled. So it could be impossible to achieve both. In that case, you can use this parameter to tune whether you want more privacy or you want more utility. And doing so, you can allow the obfuscation mechanism to basically learn that way. So it, it allows uh, users to, uh, to basically give importance to one or the other. Finally, it, the scheme itself is data independent. So like in case of blurring, uh, typically used for images, um, but in this case, you don't have like data specific uh, transformation. As long as you have enough information and in comes of training data, you can, generate such an obfuscation mechanism. And in, in the evaluation section, I'll, I'll describe how do we uh, evaluate this on images as well as sensor data. Uh, any questions before I move further? Yeah, um, I got a question. <laughs> um, sure. Really wondering how um, sort of the, you verify the obfuscation. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking uh, specifically about, I mean, I guess a lot of things. I mean, one thing would be really nice if you actually shown us uh, some examples of obfuscated, uh, you know, driver driver images to see what the model uh, comes up with. But um, you know, adversarial examples, right? So so famously, uh, classifiers also also the work of Goodfellow, 
um, you know, classifiers get confused by just judiciously um, manipulating a few pixels. Uh, changes that are, you know, virtually undetectable to humans can actually turn a, you know, a classification of a cat into classification of fire truck or ostrich. I mean, you know, shocking, shocking failures. So right. how do you know that your attacker wouldn't, you know, the, uh, the obfuscator just wouldn't learn adversarial tricks to fool the attacker? And thus, you know, you okay. The, your attacker is stymied. Your your obfuscation is, you know, verified. But but any human actually looking at the images would, you know, very readily be able to tell um, what the original, you know, all the the protected information would would extract that very easily. So great question. I do have example images, and I wanted to show you later on. But why don't we directly jump to that? Um, here. Um, so this is a slightly different data set. There is a data set called KTH, which is a data set of uh, people performing different activities. And the goal here was like to preserve the activity. There are like about six different activities that people are performing. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, roughly it's the same amount of people in the data set. So the goal was to ensure that you cannot identify a person but you can identify the activity so on the left you see original images and uh it's not great because the images are very tiny and so i had to like make them larger to so that it's easy to see in the presentation and on the right you see obfuscated images so from human's perspective that's totally garbage Agreed. you would not know anything that's happening here so and I, I don't want to claim anything because we haven't actually done any evaluation using humans and asking them, hey, can you identify certain things in this? But uh, just by looking at the images, we thought that this makes sense. Um, the, the main point here is that we want the app to work. And again, when I say app, I mean the model that's being used to perform activity recognition to work on the obfuscated data without changing the model so in this case the model was trained on original images that were on the left but it also worked on the obfuscated images without retraining that's on the right and that's because you have that feedback in the learning obfuscation mechanism so the highlighted images i'm showing you are of the same activity performed by two different people and on the right you see sort of similar looking blurb uh, so it, as long as you have the same activity, it does uh, have the similar uh, information. It looks like that at least on the visual, when you when you inspect visually. Uh, we did test it by generating synthetic data to verify that it is indeed the case where uh, we could preserve features. So if you have if you just so what we did is we artificially created uh, just two Gaussian and um, have no correlation between two variables one we assigned as a private one we assigned as a public and then if you run the obfuscation mechanism that we just i just described it will simply randomize the private variable and it will keep the public variable so it does preserve that information in case of images it's hard to visualize but that's what's happening under the hood on the other hand the second row that i'm showing you is the same person performing different activities and on the right, you see corresponding obfuscation where you see very different images, uh, which shows that it, the, the, since it, the activities are different, you have different sorts of features in that output. Um, so this is just to answer, how do we know that the obfuscator is not doing some sort of adversarial tricks um, and actually obfuscating the data? So this is one way to answer that. The second uh, way to answer the question is, we use this iterative optimization. So, so when, we, when people talk about adversarial, uh, sorry, adversarial examples, they do not necessarily always talk about retraining the model on adversarial examples. In fact, there are papers that shows that if you do add adversarial example in the training set, the, net, the model become robust to those adversarial examples. So in our case, when we say attacker, we are actually um, 
giving the attacker all the obfuscated data along with the true labels. So we give them whatever you see on the right along with the labels of identity and say that now go and learn to identify people in these images. And then we that's how we basically measure privacy. That's how when we say when I say quant some sort of verifiability, it, 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 it's in that sense. Uh, again, I'm not claiming that I have theoretical guarantees, but in practice, when we ran a bunch of different not networks, not just the one that's used for training the obfuscation, uh, we show that it is indeed the case that the network fails to learn. In fact, in our uh, case, we use neural network as an attacker to train the obfuscation model, but we, when we were verifying the attacks, Oh, sorry, when we were verifying the obfuscation mechanism, we not only use neural network, we also use different bunch of models like uh, SVM or random forest and so on. And all of them were trained on these obfuscated images along with the labels and were uh, asked to attack the mechanism. Okay. Um, you're I think maybe the most striking thing is you're telling me that an app, like sort of an off the shelf app that was not expecting um, obfuscation, nonetheless, your obfuscator found that that pattern of corruption actually conveyed information that the app was able to use to preserve its its uh, its functionality. Yes, yeah, it's surprising. I know. Right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Thank again, you. it's it's not that it. We haven't like extensively tried with a lot of different cases. We tried with a bunch of data sets, and uh, we simulated through. Um, generating the classifier, or sorry, train the classifier on those data set and we show that it works. We tried with a uh, couple of apps, but yeah, I mean, so again, I don't want to claim that it works in all the cases, but especially things like activity recognitions or object recognition, it seems to work in, 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 in these scenarios. So two quick questions related to that. Um, are you only able to protect the information you're enumerating as private? And the other aspect of it is, is if you have a malicious app that you're using, can the app sneak information through because it's in your training loop? So again, great question. So first, to answer the first question, yes, we are only protecting the uh, private information that we are enumerating. Uh, we do not basically protect anything that's not being used during the training and the second is yes um, it is possible in theory that the app can access information during the training set um, but let's hold on to that question until i show the experiment because that will make it i mean it will be easier to answer that question there um, any other questions Okay. So, yeah, I mean, we, I think we were here. Um, Actually, I, I did have one, one question. I think Mike asked this originally, uh, which was, uh, did you try just generating stick figures as, as some, as something that would remove personalized or identifying data, but still convey, um, the you know what was going on just reduce everything to a stick figure um that no we didn't try that but i know a uh, couple of folks who did uh work on this which and which they claim that the gait of a human can reveal information so the way you walk or the way you you move your hands and stuff uh, also reveal information. So they've, they've showed that um, just by looking at the stick figure, you can identify a person. So um, yeah, that, that's why we didn't go to that route. Yeah, the, the, military, the, the military discovered that um, uh, for identifying terrorist targets in foreign countries, that they could, identi they could identify people um, from the, the drone footage uh, based upon their gait. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know about that, but yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised because, and, and that is why we have this idea of adversarial learning, where we say that 
it's very hard to come up with a one fixed approach where, okay, blur this or hide this or remove this information in the data when you want a general mechanism. So the way we go by is that, okay, if we have enough training data set, throw in the training data, specify what is private, what is not private, and let the network figure out what features to, to preserve and what features to hide. And if you think about it, let's say, so for, so for example, the, you have these auto encoders, right? Which, which takes the image and then basically maps the information in the image from the image dimension to, to a very small vector where you have this middle code layer. And then it basically use that information to again, um, construct the image. So all you need is that everything that you need to construct the image is actually basically encoded in that vector. And if you visualize that vector, it will look garbage to you. Uh, but somehow the network can do that. Uh, and that's that's the basic principle behind doing all these things. And that's probably answer your question. Like, how does the app work with this random looking data? Because what the obfuscator is doing underlying the hood is that under the hood is that you, you make sure that whatever that features that are important for the app or model, they are preserved in that that representation you have. And once you have this, all you are doing is just projecting back to the image domain. It, it doesn't need to necessarily have the image look in a sense. It doesn't need to be human understandable. So that's one of the limitation of our work. So if you want an obfuscation mechanism that generates uh, realistic images or realistic data, it, it doesn't work with this. I mean, and we, we actually try to do that with this approach where we say that let's make sure that both looks similar because then you can generate realistic images and realistic data point but but it was very hard to train such thing and preserve the privacy uh, of the data okay so um basically the olympus works in two phases you have an offline phase where you need three things, you need training data along with the privacy and utility labels. Um, you need app uh, and the model of the app. Um, and then you do the iterative optimization where you learn the obfuscator, I'm oh, sorry, you train the obfuscator by minimizing privacy and utility loss. For privacy loss, you send the obfuscator data to the attacker and get the loss from the attacker. For utility, you send the data to the app model and get the utility from the apps model and the goal is to minimize this in the next iteration you train the attacker where you maximize the privacy loss so you have the obfuscated data you have the true privacy labels and you try to find the private information in the data and whatever loss you get you want to maximize that loss so you do this iterative optimization and ultimately you read, you stop when the attacker can no longer identify private information in the uh, data. And in our case, concretely, it basically stops when the uh, classification is cl close to random guessing. And once you have the attacker, you, you deploy it. Uh, and in the online phase, you put it between Tensor and the app. And uh, once you get the data, you just apply the obfuscation and you feed the obfuscated data to the app. So let's look at the driver activity example, right? Uh, we want to identify activity of a driver, but we want to preserve the privacy of the driver. Uh, in this case, you can have a training data set where you need a bunch of drivers uh, images, and you need to have privacy labels, which are driver's identity, and you also need the utility labels, which are driver's activity. Now, if you're using an app, you can simply get those labels from the app. Uh, since our goal is to make sure that the, it works with the app, we are not really looking for true activity labels. All we need is whatever classifier of the app gives us, and that should be sufficient. Um, so getting a utility label should be fairly easy, but privacy labels, you need some manual work uh, or some public data set. Um, then once we have the training data, we need 
to basically figure out what are the losses. So typically in this case for privacy loss, you can use some sort of cross entropy loss that uh, can be used to predict driver's identity. And for the utility loss, you can do the same that predicts the activity or whatever apps model is using as loss. And here's an example of an obfuscator, which is essentially an auto encoder. So you get the unperturbed image, you apply some series of convolution, and then you have this middle layer, which we call it code layer, which contains all the information about the data. And then you basically upsample it back to the original image. So this is what I was referring to earlier, where everything is essentially boils down to preserving whatever information you want to do in code layer and throwing out everything else. So that when you project it back into the image domain, you ensure that only app essential information is preserved and rest is thrown away. Um, you can achieve this by essentially minimizing privacy and utility loss. In this case, cross entropy loss of identifying the driver's identity and the activity. In uh, the attacker is basically convolution neural network, which takes the obfuscated image, applies series of convolutions, and then finally applies the softmax to predict the probability of each driver. And the goal here is to maximize this um, privacy loss. Uh, in other words, you want to be able to accurately identify the driver. So with once we have these two networks, you can basically run the minimax optimization algorithm. And then uh, once you are uh, once you achieve the equilibrium, which is the attacker can no longer identify the driver, you can use the obfuscator trained here to just obfuscate the future data points. Okay, so um, for evaluation, we basically evaluated the mechanism on three fronts. Uh, the first one is utility, which basically tries to capture how well the Olympus is preserving app essential information. And we capture it through accuracy of the apps model. The second one is privacy, which tells how well Olympus hides private information. And this is captured through accuracy of the attacker. And finally, we have um, a UK study where we apply this to a real world app and show that indeed the app works. So here are the data sets that we used for evaluation. Uh, we have two image data sets and two motion sensor data set. Um, all the data sets are essentially used to get basically used for activity recognition. Um, and you see on the utility classes column, the number of activities performed at each data set. Uh, and then for private information, we use identity as the variable that we want to protect. And you have on the last column, the number of private classes, so number of identities in the data set. Now state farm is highlighted because that simulates the distracted driving um, scenarios that we were talking about. It basically has a bunch of images where there are people are driving in a car um, and they're performing one of the 10 activities. Um, and there are 10 such people in the data set. So we want to preserve the activity that the, they are doing and uh, hide, sorry, um, yeah, we want, we want to preserve the activity and hide the identity. And we do the trainings in a standard fashion. We split the data set into training, validation, and test set. We uh, train the Olympics using training set and then use the validation to pick the best obfuscator and then use the test set to uh, evaluate the learned obfuscator, uh, obfuscator. So here is the graph that shows you how the app and attacker works as we train the model. So on x-axis, you see the number of epochs, the number of training iterations, and on the y-axis, you see accuracy. Um, uh, this is for the KTH dataset, which has about six users and six uh, activities. The green horizontal bar tells you the accuracy of random guessing when you are guessing the identity of a person. Um, the blue one tells you the accuracy of the app uh, 
uh, on the obfuscated data and the red one tells you the accuracy of the attacker on the obfuscated data so what's happening here as we start the typically the obfuscator and this brings back to the question where during the training are we revealing information to the app or any malicious adversaries um so so one answer to that is if you have a set of training data set that's available and that's public you can use that and that's the best option to do uh, in that case you don't have to worry about leaking information during the training however our hypothesis and again this is not theoretically sound but we do not uh, the, the way it's structured we don't reveal too much information to the attacker during the training as well and this is what this graph shows so as we start initially the the obfuscator is just randomly initialized so whatever output it has is typically random and as the uh, training progresses the utility loss will force the obfuscator to keep app essential information and that's where you see as you move along the training path you see the increasing apps accuracy like the accuracy of app start keeps increasing on the other hand the accuracy of the attacker stays close to random because the privacy laws will ensure that you're not adding or leaking any information in the output um, so if there is a leak in the information you would see high accuracy of the attacker along the training but typically it stays close to random so we are not leaking too much information and this is what we have seen in almost all the data sets and all the training iterations have to date. Um, so yeah, that's that's the answer of the question. And this is basically the graph that shows uh, for all four data sets the accuracy of the apps classifier on original and the part of data. So the blue bar shows you the accuracy of the on the original data and the green one shows you accuracy on the obfuscated data x-axis is the data sets you see the number of classes in this and y-axis is the accuracy so for the hard and opportunity which are sensor data set we achieve very similar results on perturbed and unperturbed data um, there is a slight drop in the accuracy on the image classification and uh, typically in cases like this it's it's hard because there is a very tight correlation between the identity and activities such as whether the person is looking in front or not so due to this we do see a slight drop in the accuracy uh, and that's the price we need to pay to protect the privacy now this slide shows you uh, how accurately we preserve the privacy of uh, in, in the uh, obfuscated data so again we have these four data sets on the second column we see number of privacy classes these are number of people in the data set and we use a separate neural network that's trained from scratch on labeled obfuscated data and then we run the uh, we evaluate that attacker on held out test set so first uh, the column shows you uh, accuracy on unperturbed data so if we train an attacker on unperturbed data this is what we get like we almost every time able to accurately find the person in the data and which is not surprising however when we apply the obfuscation the accuracy drops significantly and the last column shows you the accuracy of random guessing so um, as we see in the table the numbers are very close so with the obfuscator um, the attacker is not able to guess anything more than random guessing and as i mentioned uh, we also did experiments not only using the neural network but we also use bunch of other um, models like random forest or logistic regressions and so on and those gave similar results uh, if you're interested you can uh, look at the paper i can share the link later on in the chat and finally, we did the case study on an app. Uh, it's a handwriting recognition app 
uh, that was available on Play Store, uh, which was using TensorFlow model. So we downloaded the app and the goal here is that using the handwriting style, you can identify a person. Uh, so the so so the privacy problem that we posed here is that we want to obfuscate a handwritten digit so that you can protect the identity of the person, but you can still get the uh, ac maintain the accuracy of digit recognition. Uh, so we have these privacy and identity goals set. Uh, we collected a bunch of training data for this case study. We picked two users. We asked them to draw images and we collected 300 images of their handwriting per user. We labeled them manually and then we deploy, uh, basically we perform this experiment on Nexus 9 tablet. Uh, so we did instrument the uh, Nexus 9 so that as soon as the um, the user draws something on the screen, we capture the information before it reaches the app. So you can hook different sorts of APIs to do that. And for this, I think we use Exposed Framework, which is publicly available. It's open source. Uh, you can instrument the Android OS to hook any of the Android APIs, and that will allow you to access the data before it gets to the app. Um, so we, we use the model uh, of the app, like the transfer model to train the obfuscator using the training data and then put up the images. And then we use the put up the images to evaluate how well it works with the app. And we also separately trained an attacker to attack these obfuscated images. So the results are shown in this graph. On x-axis, you have the accuracy of both app and the attacker. Um, again, blue bars are unperturbed images, green ones are the obfuscated perturbed images, and the y-axis is accuracy. So in case of the app, we achieve similar performance, and there's a very slight drop, um, And but most of the time we were, the app was able to identify the digit correctly, even in the obfuscated data. And remember, this app is it's downloaded from the Play Store. We do not change anything on the app side. The attacker, on the other hand, was able to identify the identity with high accuracy on the original images that shows that it is indeed possible to identify user by their handwriting. Um, but after the obfuscation, uh, the performance of the attacker was close to random guessing. Uh, we also measure the time because that's the another added cost you pay because you are now obfuscating the data. But on Nexus 9, it was the median time, uh, sorry, the mean time to obfuscate the image was about eight milliseconds. So it wasn't too bad um, to run the obfuscator on the device itself. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we basically propose a utility aware obfuscation mechanism that uses minimax optimization approach. Uh, the idea is to have a competing networks that uh, help each other so that you can learn an obfuscation mechanism as well as verify that it's really uh, working. And on a bunch of the benchmark data, data sets, we show that Olympus hides private information without significantly affecting the app's accuracy. And we also show uh, by instrumenting Android OS that it you can actually use that in practice by intercepting the data, obfuscating the data, and it does work with the app without changing anything on the app side. So yeah, that's it. Um, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to ask. Thanks, Nisarg. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple questions in the chat, but they might have been answered. Does anybody want to ask any questions now? Yeah, um, and there's a, a marvelous proof of concept demonstration, but um, of course you're, you're really working, proving it out with very, very sort of small tasks so far, uh, especially with the, the real app, um, distinguishing being, you know, between two people. Um, what happens as you try to push this uh, with sort of larger, more sort of real world data sets? So um, 
I, I think larger data sets would help certainly because the more data you have, it's you are feeding the office cutter more information. Um, the tricky part is not about the large data sets. Uh, the tricky part is what happens if we have other variants like things like identity and um, activities seems to be working fine, but we haven't really tested on other attributes such as like simultaneously there is a, another uh, group of people who did apply similar work uh, who did apply similar techniques and they show that it also works for things like race and gender but more complex things like for example what if you want to hide i don't know uh, a number plate a license plate uh, in in a google street view uh, can you use this type of techniques or what if something that's very uh, uh, tightly coupled with the the information that you really want uh, so that's something that is unexplored um, and the other thing is getting the label data is slightly harder for these tasks right. so well, especially with the private information yeah i was just thinking i mean larger data sets but these would in turn you know require larger models in the app and so you know uh, the digit recognition you know a very small model will do and maybe that somehow you know sort of really simplifies the problem relative to a task that's, um, you know, detecting um, whether, you know, lesions, skin lesions are cancerous or not, you know, some maybe one of these medical apps. Uh, right. So it, yeah, I, I understand. Uh, on To be honest with you, we haven't tried that, but okay. we did try activity recognition, which is not as simple as digit recognition. Um, I, we'd also tried uh, object recognition. So we have the CFAR 10, popular vision data sets, which has different sorts of objects in it. Uh, we experimented with those objects and we were able to identify the objects, but things like skin lesion and all, uh, we haven't tried it. Um, my, um, sus uh, I, my hypothesis is that it should be possible as long as your private information is not tightly coupled with the things that you want. For example, the fact that you're, you have a, a classifier that is able to identify um, skin lesion from the raw data or from the original image means that it is possible to identify the information from the data. Uh, it is possible to classify them. So adding an obfuscation. So, okay, let me rephrase that. Imagine a scenario where you don't have any private information, right? So the attacker will basically no, the, doesn't need to do anything. In that case, mm -hmm. what obfuscator is doing is just learning an identity function. So it's just going to output the same image. And then in that case, the app works perfectly fine. And when I say perfectly fine, I mean, whatever accuracy the app classifier has will be preserved. In the case when you have a private information, that's where the obfuscator is forced to remove some information. So that really depends on what is your private information. It's not so much on what classifier or what app essential information is. It's, it's so much about the correlation between the private and public information, as well as what are the private information. Not sure if that makes sense or if, did I answer your question? No, that's that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess I'll follow up briefly. Um, if this comes to fruition, uh, what is the, whose privacy are you protecting from whom with this? Is this something where I can not trust the app, um, but I have to trust your obfuscator? I'm trying to figure out kind of like where in the chain I still have to trust someone. I see. So yes, so the obfuscator, um, so we have one separate paper where we try to, uh, establish a privacy framework for mobile OS, which is sort of a plugin driven framework. So imagine you have these browsers, right? And you have a bunch of plugins, um, for example, ad blocker. I use that and I trust the ad blocker. Um, and I don't really know the internal details, but typically it's open source. So people as a community have trusted that thing and they can look into it and figure out what's happening. So, so that same principle that we used to build a privacy framework that's plugin driven. And the idea in that paper was we, we have these privacy plugins where um, 
privacy experts can write those plugins and typically they are open source and you have this platform and you can basically free, um, put the plugins in between the source like the sensor data and the apps so that you can trust the operating system and the plugins and when i say trust plugins i mean uh they are open source so it's easy to trust them and so so really what you're doing is you're just trusting the operating system and we also limit the damage the plugin does uh in that framework so that even if a plugin is malicious it's going to only um affect the data that you are sharing the plugin with it's not going to affect anything else in the system uh, so to 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 the short answer is uh you yes you do have to trust someone and the the idea here is that we build these obfuscator make them open source so that people can write it audit it and then deploy them within the operating system so that once you trust the operating system you're fine. You don't have to trust anything else outside the OS. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting presentation. Thanks. Great. So I think there's a question from Mike in the chat. Um, what will you do to convince those who would purchase your technology that the GAN filter won't de degrade their detection? Um, well, I would just run the GAN filter on the app and show that it is indeed working. I guess that's the only thing you can do. Um, but so while I was working on this, there is another limitation though. This is, this needs to be shared. Like the app model needs to be shared at least to run these, uh, at least to be used during the training site, uh, training and collect the utility labels. And that might be one of the bottleneck because um, the companies in general may not be willing to share that. And the argument we, um, the, the only solution that I can think of is then the companies themselves should provide these obfuscator and they should train it. And in some sense, it's beneficial because now not only your app is going to work with these obfuscation, but you also can give more stronger claims on privacy and say that, hey, we do collect this information from you, but we are not really actually leaking any sensitive information because we are not even receiving those sensitive information. Um, yeah, um, that's the best answer I could come up with. Um, a question from David um, on the adversary model. What does the honest but curious adversary model mean? So. Honest but curious model means the attacker is going to do whatever it claims to do, uh, but it can use its power to identify whatever information it can from the data that you share it with. So it's not going to, for example, collude with someone other party. So typically in the realistic setting, the you 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 have different sorts of assumptions. So for example, what if the attacker collides with the app and then get the information well in that case you can't do anything with this particular solution uh, so if, when we say honest but curious we mean the attacker is not going the author is going to pro follow the protocol meaning it's not going to do collusion it's not going to get any external information uh, it's going to do whatever it's stated but it can whatever data it has which is known it can do whatever in its power to exploit that data. Uh, yeah, that's what it means. And the attacker is not a passive observer. It's actually an active adversary, meaning, uh, it, so in the in the realm of things, we do assume the office cater is sitting within the OS and the OS is trusted and the apps are outside OS boundaries. So once the data leaves the OS boundaries, which is after the obfuscation, the attacker can access the data and do whatever it can with the data. So it's not really passive, it's just it actively uh, accessing the information. Um, and it can it can train itself with enough labels to, to simulate the, to try to learn the private information. And that's what we actually do during the evaluation. We give bunch of obfuscated data along with the privacy labels and 
ask the attacker, hey, go and try to learn and break the obfuscation. Got it. Yep. Sweet. So I think those were all the questions. Does anyone have anything else? If not, yeah, thank you for your time, Sorry, This was a great talk, great talks tonight, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So our, our last uh, part of the conference are lightning talks. So if anyone has any, want to talk about any data science topic for like five to 10 minutes um, in any format, uh, now's the time. I think, uh, Mark, you had, you had a talk to share? Yes. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let's share. Are you seeing Jupyter Lab shortcut problem on Windows? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so I, I use Anaconda as as my uh, uh, distribution change change management for. Uh, the open source products that I use, and I installed Jupyter Lab, but when I went to run it, uh, I got stuck in a loop, and so it would it would start up, and then I'd see the screen, but the screen really wouldn't sh allow me to get control, and in the background, uh, the uh, the kernel was in a loop. And it wasn't it wasn't uh, uh, try it wasn't able to see or write to a particular directory. And the first thing that I did was uh, okay, let me just start up Anaconda, and then in Anaconda I can run uh, this command. Uh, let's see, I can run this command, and this is in Windows, and and that would do it. But I really wasn't satisfied with not using the shortcut because the shortcut is is it's handy. Just double click on it and it's it's done. So uh, I looked around and uh, the shortcut itself was the problem. And what you'll see here, this is all one string that's in the shortcut. Um, so so what you're seeing on many lines is actually on one line. Um, and as it turns out, I didn't realize this, that the, there's a 168 character limit on shortcuts. Um, and it, it crosses lots of Windows boundary, lots of Windows versions. Um, but there is that hard limit. Second thing that you'll, you should notice is that all of the, all of these include, or all of these paths down into um, C users, public documents, and Anaconda three to uh, to describe what's what's to be done. So what I did was create a an environment variable. So if I right click on uh, computer properties and then uh, go to this advanced system settings. And then in advanced system settings, the dialog uh, box has environment variables. And then I created a new environment variable called Anaconda3, which is that string. Then I can go back and substitute all of those instances of that, uh, that path name with percent Anaconda3%, percent, which automatically does the substitution with the, with the set variables. And um it starts up it starts up just just fine now so that was that was a problem and i didn't realize that that was a uh, uh, a problem but it it seems like the most elegant solution because now i've got a shortcut back any questions did you ever <clears throat> start jupyter lab from a different continent environment so I, I guess i'm wondering how you would handle different virtual environments um, I really only have one, I really only have one Anaconda environment and within Anaconda, you and can, space. and, and you can specify, okay, the version, uh, the version I want to start up of Julia or Python or whatnot, um, is, 
a particular a particular version that is under the umbrella of Anaconda. But I, I only have one Anaconda environment. Right. And I, I only have one Anaconda install too. I meant like like multiple Python virtual environments under that. I often run different versions of Jupyter Lab inside a different Anaconda environment. Um, you know, and I just from a Windows command line, I just do conda activate and the environment that I want, and then I launch Jupyter Lab from that environment. Right. And and that would go back to if 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 I were if I if I had that problem, then I would probably fall back to um, opening up the Anaconda prompt, and then with a command line with a command line directive at um, um, within the Anaconda prompt environment, uh, specify what I needed to in terms of version or starting location, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. As promised, it was it was a technical it was a technical talk this month. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else? Lightning talk. All right, cool. Um, yeah, if nothing else, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, the May Pi Data Conference. And uh, our next uh, meetup will be July 7th. So I'll see everyone there.